an honor to speak with you, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'd like to uh, kind of run across a, uh, a pretty broad spectrum from the mission of education to the nature of learning to <clears throat> the nature of learning to read, and from there into literacy and uh, domains of knowledge, vocabulary, etc. Right. Can you contextualize it for me a little bit? Uh, what what this uh, this is going to be a TV? Well, yes, we're okay. working on a television show. Uh -huh. uh, we've conducted uh, 250 hours of interviews with uh, about 110 different folks uh, related to different dimensions of learning to read. I see. Um, <clears throat> from the neuroscience to the vocabulary, oral language, early literacy, oh, good. Mm -hmm. to the um, do some domain knowledge uh, issues, but primarily um, the relationship between the code and its history, evolution, and structure, and the uh, brain processes associated with creating this, uh, at least initially, simulated language stream. Right. And, um, how the relationships between ambiguity and the code create stutters in the brain and <laughs> uh, yeah. all of that. Fascinating. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a terrifically uh, uh, interesting subject in its own right. Of course, that's not my main subject. As no, no, I, I, I well understand that. And yet, uh, I do appreciate the work that you've done to show the connectivity between various components and constituents in becoming literate. And so whereas we focus a lot on the kind of bottoms up uh, neuroscience meets code, there's other dimensions having to do with um, once the machinery's working well, having the background knowledge and the uh, do domain specific knowledge necessary to, to be able to make the inferences and fly. Right, right. Uh, well, uh, you, you know, there was an assumption even, I mean, I, 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 let me not preempt your own line of emphasis. So you, you can, if you'd like, ask me a question. But what you just said uh, makes me sort of think that it's useful to point out that at one time, even experts, such experts as John B. Carroll, a very distinguished psychologist, thought that once you mastered the code and could turn the symbols into language, that then it was a kind of developmental process which the n a normal course of experience would lead you to make progress in. in. And we know from the difference between, say, fourth grade reading scores and, and eighth grade reading scores that that developmental process doesn't happen automatically after all. Yeah, it, it depends on the uh, life learning trajectory. It, it, absolutely. It depends on things. And the other point that that I think, for clarification, mm -hmm. uh, need, needs that, that needs to be made is that once the decoding process is mastered and symbols are t visual symbols are turned into uh, language, that the process of comprehending the language is not inherently different. Uh, when heard phonically in, in speech or when decoded phonically with the eye. Uh, and that, that's a critical thing, it seems to me, because it means that reading, even though reading has all these exotic neuroscientific and other aspects to it, when the visual symbols are actually turned into language, the, the, the requirements for comprehension are the same, I whether it's a visual or, or auditory. Right. I, I completely concur. And, and uh, one of, that's one of the reasons that we, we try to frame this as a language simulation system. Right. Um, and though there's some argument that we transcend the sound barrier with reading and move on to uh, you know, master reading, moves beyond the rate of processing and some that aspects. That used to be the argument. I don't think it's held widely anymore. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. I'd like to hear whether you've heard, the, I mean, the latest on the cognitive science front. Because, you know, they, they, it's, uh, the, the silent 
reading and all the rest and 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 trying to get people not to uh, sub vocalize and all, all of that was a very popular oh 50 years ago 40 years ago right uh and then came along something called the uh, oh dear i think <laughs> the phonic cycle or whatever it is psychologically which you know all about by now i'm sure <laughs> uh and so I, when when i was reading badly on this subject he's a wonderful book by the way he's a, you, you know badly his work a human memory and uh, that uh, that made me think that um, you know that this idea of silent processing was not altogether accurate. So what's the latest on that? Well, I only drop that as a caveat because there is still some resistance to the notion of language simulation, and oh, I it, and it has to do with the fact that that the rate of speed of word processing in a uh, really well-developed reader is moving at a speed that's faster than the way that we would uh, speak it. And so consequently, there's some difference in the, in the language processing rates that, um, that create some disconnect. Or well, actually, I read about that at about 15 or 20 years ago. And uh -huh. at that point, they were dealing with something called accelerated, you know, they would accelerate uh, sound recordings and uh, found that there wasn't a big difference. If you, we can't talk that fast, but we can process uh, auditory. What they did was speed up the rate uh, and then reduce the frequencies to make it more normal again. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Un understand, uh, uh, and uh, that that would increase the frequency if you increase the rate. But then they had a device by which they increase the rate and then decrease the frequency so that you were getting a really fast talker. <laughs> I don't know if you know that work, but it was uh, it, it got up to, what was it, 300 words a, a minute, something like that. Mm. I actually have done some experiments for some of the uh, work that we do with increasing and decreasing the rate of sound just to show the tension you feel when you, outs when you go outside a certain envelope of, of comprehensibility. Yeah, yeah and, and what, what, what sort of rate did you get, get to? Um, I, I, I didn't get it to a point where I'm actually measuring rates. It's more of an audience experience to just show uh -huh. that there is, in fact, a kind of temporal profile window uh -huh. that if you go too slow, you know, it's, it's almost annoying. And if you go too fast, then it's, you know, so there is a window there. Yeah. But the, I think the, the, the uh, what I, I'm in a, agreement here in the core, which is that um, I look at reading as a uh, artificial code-informed and instructed a simulation of language. Right. And that, yeah, I, absolutely. And that um, <clears throat> one of the things that really amazes me is that we don't use oral language measures to uh, create a reference point for understanding where people are in reading. Absolutely. I, and so with you on that, I don't know if you uh, had a chance to look at my new book called the Knowledge Deficit. No, I have it on order. I've been reading some of your articles online, and I have your cultural literacy work. Uh huh. Well, this is, it goes into a little more detail on on just the kinds of points you're raising. Uh, that, um, yeah, I, yeah. So I I I'm just curious whether that in, was informing what you say. But anyway, I I think you're right on. Yeah, and it's in that sense that um, one other thing I wanted to mention relative to what you said a few moments ago is that reading ma reading mastery is a um, a fuzzier term in that um, <coughs> there is one aspect of uh, comprehensional problems which we could say is related to to a lack of the vocabulary and domain-specific knowledge necessary to relate the new to the known. Right. And there's an uh, overall um, efficiency of automaticity yes. that um, has more to do with the processing machinery that at one level of measurement we could say, well, they're instrumentally reading OK, but the ecology and the efficiency with which they're reading is not <coughs> uh, leaving sufficient uh, processing resources available for the subsequent comprehension work. And that, that space right there is pretty fuzzy. Well, uh, you know Stick's work on this. Um, 
it was interesting because uh, his his work suggested that you don't get the the re it, on average this of course varies tremendously but you don't get the processing efficiency up um, uh, on average until you get to about seventh grade um, to the point where it's equal to the auditory right which again requires um, you know a great number of exposures with sufficient uh, relevancy stretch right. that right. it's 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 exercising processing and building vocabulary and knowledge. Well, you're awfully well informed about all this, and and so uh, <laughs> are you a psychologist yourself? No, nope, I'm a, uh, I'm a learning activist, you could say. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and who who have you? Have you t you've talked to all the big shots like Torgerson and Shaywitz? And I've talked to Shaywitz. I haven't been able to get to Torgerson. I've talked to, um, in this field, uh, Chuck Perfetti. Oh, yeah, I've Perfetti. talked with uh, Stanovich, yeah. uh, Rayner on eye movements, uh -huh. uh, Talal and Merznak on uh, phonological processing. Yeah. Um, one of the pieces of work that I'm most uh, intrigued with is uh, Zvia Bresnitz in Israel's. On asynchrony? No, but I don't know this. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating. I'm going to look, see, watch your program with tremendous interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a um, on our website. There's links to. There's about 35 of our interviews published online now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, in addition to the kind of neuroscience uh, processing level, we've also talked with people as far away from this field, you might think, as uh, James Heckman, Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh -huh. on productivity arguments for investing differently in children. Yeah, and, uh, and we've uh, talked with, uh, you know, Todd Risley. Well, this is great stuff. I mean, these are, this is, as, as a matter of fact, uh, productivity is another, I, I didn't put it that way in my early writings, but the idea of making the knowledge, the, the background knowledge that you get as uh, selective and to the point as possible to be uh, for a, a particular speech community. I mean, the whole concept, re, this is another point that I, I do stress in the new book more than I had in the old. Uh, I, I, I wondered to myself whether instead of using the term cultural literacy, I should have used the term speech community, which is a, a well-known uh, principle in sociolinguistics, uh -huh. and the whole sphere of sociolinguistics needs to be brought into this uh, reading discussion and reading debate. I mean, that's a field in its own right, right. just as much as psycholinguistics is. And <laughs> I mean, speech is a social phenomenon, and, right? And not to bring in the concept of the speech community. I mean, we have to learn different stuff than the Chinese have to learn. Absolutely, and, and well, which is already—I mean, it's a very simple point, but it's already proving a great deal about the the, the commonality and sociality. Of, which also of, speaks of, to uh, some of the, um, you know, disadvantaged children and the kind of absolutely. life learning environments they're in relative to the difference in the uh, speech community. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and and that's why the function of schooling is to get that socialized information, uh, ver uh, linguistically socialized information, into the child's mind as, as effectively as possible with this little opportunity. Right, and the, di the d difficulty, you know, among others, is the is, is building the relevancy bridges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, speaking of language, one other person's who, who work you, that you may or may not have encountered that I think is just really brilliant is Terrence Deacon. No, but let me write this down because I want to find out about it. Um, He's a... Uh, how do you spell it? Uh, last name is D-E-A-C-O-N. Uh -huh. First name Terrence, T-E-R-R-E-N-C-A-C-E. -E. Uh -huh. um, there's a link to our interview on our website. Uh -huh. And um, he is a uh, cognitive anthropologist uh -huh. and linguistic uh, specialty uh -huh. um, at Berkeley, uh, uh -huh. trained at Harvard, who wrote a book called The Symbolic Species, The Coevolution of Language in the Brain. Oh, well, I, that's really, I, I thought that uh, <laughs> this is a really important subject because 
it, it, it actually it probably relates to, as they get deeper into it into optimal ways of vocabulary acquisition because how we learn as and and the way we learn as much vocabulary as we learn. But did you happen to talk to George A. Miller? Uh, he's an old guy by now, but uh, no, I haven't. He's, I think, the best person in vocabulary acquisition. Huh. Good. I'll I'll get after him. He, uh, he's emeritus at Princeton, and there's another man who has. I mentioned both these people in in the book, but anyway, you. You, you want to know what I have. Yeah, actually, actually, I'm very interested in all this stuff. But yes, I, yes I, I call to talk with you about other things, yes. Um, I'd like to, to weave our way up to the um, body of our conversation by starting to explore two different questions with you. One, and they're obviously related, one is a, a question, what is learning? And the other one has to do with what is the mission of education. And I'd like to just, and frankly, also, if you don't mind, um, you know, I doubt there's too many people that would read this that wouldn't already know who you are. But a a few minute uh, background sketch on you would be helpful as well, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Maybe we could start with that. Okay. And and uh, so what what are you asking? I'm asking um, how is it that you come into the work that you do? Oh. Um, what is it that uh, lit your fire, so to speak? Well, uh, yeah. Well, that's easily answered because um, it was a kind of revelation experience I had in the 70s. I was uh, interested in the teaching of, of writing, um, doing a better job at various technical aspects of how, how do you get people to write better. Uh -huh. And uh, I was doing some real actual randomized uh, experiments, uh, which were actually published in a referee <laughs> journal in the end, uh, which I, I was very proud of as an English professor. Uh, and that was with different audiences. Uh, I, I was trying to detect the difference between good writing and poor writing uh, by de a, a degraded version of a well-written passage. And uh, randomly, the members of the audience would get these two different versions and answer questions about them. And there was a, a scoreboard clock, and everything was uh, care carefully controlled. And, but then what this experimentation led me to understand was that Depending on the subject matter and the audience, good writing and bad writing became quite indistinguishable uh, when the audience was not as familiar as you would expect with the domain. Right. I mean, this is something we well understand right now. Yeah, it's perfect. It's but common sense. But, but, yeah. but we didn't understand that in the 70s. That right. was not understood. Uh, you know, a lot of things are obvious in retrospect. Right, <laughs> and, and so that was what, and particularly when the kids who weren't understanding this material were community college students, mainly black, at a community college in Richmond. Uh, the, uh, the thing that really uh, changed my life was when I was examining the results of a passage from Bruce Catton. Uh, on the Civil War, and it was Lee's surrender to Grant. And it was clear that although the UVA students had no problem, or the UVA audiences had no problem with this passage, the students at the community college in Richmond huh. clearly were not on familiar terms with Grant and Lee. And you know, there are these equestrian statues of, of Lee along Monument Avenue. In <laughs> and, and you would expect in Virginia that they would know who Robert E. Lee is and about the Civil War. So, right. So that really uh, disoriented me. And shocked me, particularly as I'm a guilty Southerner uh, who is, you know, uh, concerned about race and race relations and equality of opportunity and so on. So... Uh, I, I realized that these kids were getting a raw deal. And it wasn't because they couldn't read, because the other data we had showed that they could decode perfectly well. Uh -huh. And accurately, if it were passages on why I like my roommate and so on. 
so that's what started me. That that experiment and experience. It kind of broke the uh, assumptive world of uh, the common pool of knowledge. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so that was the event and the work. And and I had happened to do work in in two fields uh, anyway in my professional life, uh, which then turned out to be to help me out. One was uh, theory of interpretation, which is really theory of reading, in a way. If you think about it. Uh, David Olson's done good work on that too. I'm sorry. David Olson. Oh yes. Uh huh. Right. And uh, it, it technically call hermeneutics. Uh huh. And uh, I, I had done work in that field and written a book or two on that. And then I had uh, also my historical background was in the Romantic period, which gave me an insight into what, what was happening in the, in the thought world, as it were, of our schools, which is very romantically influenced. So those two kinds of background, plus that experience, I guess, were the things that Let your made me go the direction yeah. I went. Huh. Excellent. And this has led you to I don't even know what the book count is, but I mean, you're, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, if you count what your first grader and kindergartner need to know and all of that stuff, well, yeah. Y yes. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations on a great body of work. Thank you. Um, maybe um, just as before we segue back into the deeper questions, we could also touch on the foundation of the uh, Core Knowledge Foundation. Well, that was founded in '86. Uh -huh. uh, it was uh, actually before the publication of uh, any of my my books, uh, because I thought that you know we needed uh, something to an agency to put this into effect, and to advocate and evidence for yeah. the necessity of core knowledge, and to, to help schools out if they decided they wanted to do it. Right, and you know, we had to develop a, an actual model curriculum that was going to put these theoretical ideas into effect. How many schools are using that now? Well, the, the, the count is uncertain uh -huh. because uh, we don't know of all the schools. They don't necessarily that, that explicitly it, have to work but, with you. Yeah. But the schools we know of that call themselves and send in their forms every year and so on as Friends of Core Knowledge, if you include preschool, is a, a, a 700 now. Wow. It's in, in, and in 47 states. Well, oh, congratulations. And, and places beyond, too. Well, it's not very many, though. <laughs> well, you know, but it's a, it's a real solid foothold, representing a kind of a lighthouse for a way of thinking that's, that's so critical out mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Yeah. So, uh, as uh, I, I, one of the epigraphs to my new book is that marvelous statement by John Maynard Keynes about the uh, superior importance of ideas over vested interests. As ideas are more important for good or evil than even the vested interests are. Yeah, uh, paralleling Einstein. Did he say something like that? Well, imagination and knowledge, you could uh -huh. almost you know, metaphorically uh, overlay somewhat. The uh, <coughs> Well, so could we could we <coughs> start with those two questions? <coughs> the uh, oh, I what, forgot what they were. Oh, the, one 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 is the domain of some discussion about the mission of education. Oh, what what is the the mission of education? Mm -hmm. Well, I actually I'm very much in line with with the instrumentalists and the people who are much debunked these days as being, uh, you know, I, I am uh, constantly attacking the view that the aim of education is learning to learn. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is the formula that's used to defend a content-free or content-indifferent uh, approach to, to elementary education in favor of a how-to version of education. But in fact, I really think of education primarily my, what my, my own interest in it 
is, is as an equalizer and an enabler for the society. I mean, it was basically the democratic idea that you want to give everybody a, a reasonable chance in, in life, no matter who their parents happen to be. So education is an on-ramp to opportunity in, in life. Yeah, and, and as an enabler, mm -hmm. so that I'm actually, in one sense, very sympathetic to the learning to learn idea. It's just that <laughs> that formalized notion of what it means <laughs> to learn how to learn is incorrect psychologically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I have written a paper myself on learning to learn. You have. I have, and and I'm and I'm um, I'm right in the middle here in the sense that um, I I view uh, knowledge, skills, and experiences as the scaffolding for extending learning. Exactly. But but learning uh, and in that sense and on there are ongoing ability to learn in unpredictable ways is incredibly important exactly but it stands on um the background <laughs> it doesn't happen in a vacuum and well, it's, and it's of, exactly and this is where the schools of education and the the things that are taught to prospective teachers in schools of education have got it quite wrong and and that tradition that content in different uh, tradition has done a great deal of harm. Yeah, yeah. Well, every time we try to get into some kind of uh, robotic scripting um, at the uh, how-to level, instead of the, um, I mean, I, what I'm really interested in that I think intersects with you is how is it that we help um, children uh, as they're growing up not learn to learn in some mechanical sense, but um, be able to um, disambiguate, differentiate. Um, I think of it more as a process of uh, extending presence than of acquiring, per se. Yeah, but it's, it's totally uh, domain constituted. Yes. If, and so if, since that's the case, clearly we can't predict uh, what these kids are going to do, whether they're going to be scientists or poets. And, uh, but what you want to do is enable them to be either. And so I, I, and for that, you need this heavy weight of knowledge. Right. Seems to me. Uh, right, right. And it not only seems to me, but, you know, the cognitive scientists all agree with this. Yeah, now. yeah. Yeah, and it's it's only in the the narrow field of educational psychology and the AERA, the Association for Educational Research, and so on, where you get um, the more content and different point of view, uh, where uh, where you, people are talking about metacognition, for example, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but my new book is essentially a diatribe against these formalistic strategies. Huh, I'll definitely enjoy that. I'll definitely enjoy that. In that, as I said, I, I, uh, I mean, I think there are certain uh, general uh, orientations and uh, modes of participation in learning, like being, uh, being self-sensing of your own uncertainty. Uh, what I call meaning needs, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, being able to differentiate, disambiguate your own meaning needs as a compass from which to proceed. Mm -hmm. But all of that operates in the context of a field. The example I gave in my book I thought was uh, really decisive, uh, or at least the, the structural argument was decisive. The, uh, people, one of the ideas about learning to learn is that children in learning to read should learn inferencing skills instead of calling it inferring for some reason they're calling it inferencing mm -hmm. and I, I try to point out that there can be no inferencing skills in the abstract because inference is filling in blanks which is necessarily context dependent which is necessarily yeah context constituted yeah and yeah, you quickly yeah you quickly got the argument. <laughs> but it isn't it isn't widely understood. And right, and one of the things though that that cuts at this is that I think children are being exposed to circumstances in which they are experiencing, you know, millions of times over the course of education, 
uh, circumstances and situations, you know, environments in which their authentic um, internal learning needs are being deadened. True. And on the other hand, there's no problem about their native inferencing skills because uh, kids, I mean, even most disadvantaged kids can do irony. Yeah. Uh, they can deal with, uh, you know, man, that's bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, they can um, perform all these operations. If you can perform them once, you can perform them any number of times. And so it's not there that they need these abstract skills. It's just that you need the the knowledge that will enable them to do to use them. Um, so, yeah, and, and I so I think we are very much on the same page here. And I, I'm I'm going to look at this with great interest. Now, you're, you're putting these interviews together in the form of a website. Now, are you yourself going to synthesize it all and write a book? Um, not until I'm done. One of the things that I'm trying to avoid. When will you know that? <laughs> um, when I say that, not until I'm done with the, the remaining interviews, which will be I this year. I see. But I, but I think a book will come out sometime next year. Mm -hmm. um, even on the website right now, there's nothing for sale. There's no how-tos. not one of them anywhere. Um, it's right now a collection of indexed interviews that have got thematic threads that run through them and, and such. And uh, we're building an index that will allow you to travel through this body. It's about uh, 2,000 paper page equivalents, I guess, online uh -huh. now. Um, and ultimately, there will be all, you know, probably 150 interviews up there. Yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is, is resource people um, doing the kind of first person learning by interacting with these people that we've interviewed and their thoughts and ideas in a conversational language mode like we're doing rather than in a right. uh, somewhat, uh, for, for a lot of teachers and parents who are, I think could understand this if there were different pathways into it, yeah. um, we're just trying to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. And then stand on top of it and summarize it and link down into it all so that uh, the uh, kind of convergence of all these different th thoughts and, uh, and perspectives and people um, you know, support uh, a kind of growing consensus well, about. Well, let me understand this yeah. language simulation idea of yours mm -hmm. because uh, it sounds to me like it's very similar to uh, uh, the simplified version of uh, saying that that reading has has two parts: turning the symbols into language and then understanding the language. Um, you seem to resist that uh, bifurcation because the whole process may be slightly different and more complex or so on. But intellectually, I'm wondering wh whether you resist it, I mean, just as a schema. Um, no, and I guess my sense is this, that if you could uh, make a, a, a map of processing in the mind, you could say that there's a language comprehension dimension and that that can be fed by normal oral language experience, or it can be artificially simulated and input to by the machinery of reading. Sure, but, but I'm curious to know whether psychologically there's any difference between the, the operations depending on the two inputs. Well, I think um, not in terms of the uh, comprehension stuff later, oh, uh, it, uh, yeah. except insofar as there are certain conventions to the structure of written language that differ from oral language. But well, I, that's that's another thing I discuss in this book is is if you take radio uh -huh. as your exemplar of oral language, right, um, and you make a transcript of radio, y you'll discover that there isn't any difference. Uh, if you take ordinary conversational speech, you'll discover that there's a huge difference. But that's a, those are genre and audience distinctions more than a difference between oral and written speech. Well, if we go back, if I, I, yeah. what I did, well, I compared the Nixon tapes, which are true oral interchanges and often incomprehensible, to um, just a, 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 a random. Uh, transcript from uh, NPR. Uh -huh. And 
one is perfectly good writing, and the other is incomprehensible. Right. So, I mean, but it's the genre of radio speech where you know you have to talk like you write. Yes. Yes. Well, parenthetically, one of the dimensions that we've um, spent some time in is how writing affected oral language developmentally. Fascinating. And, and there's no question that, and this comes out by comparison with the indigenous uh, populations who's, who've never really been exposed to, and their oral language hasn't been contaminated by the structures and processes that come in with writing. Well, this so, is where oral, I mean, um, social linguistics comes in. I think as much as... I, I, you don't want to get too uh, too constrained by interpreting it in terms of neural uh, psychology, it seems to me, or uh, uh, neurologically based uh, cognitive science, because there is a dimension to these things which can be described more accurately phenomenologically, I think, in the social context. I mean, uh -huh. the, the job of of addressing and making yourself understood to an unseen, unknown audience is a totally different communicative problem structurally than the job of either talking on the phone now with you, which is <laughs> different from our being brothers and sisters uh, who've known each other all our lives. Right. And can, you know, the, there was a sociolinguist named Bernstein. I don't know whether you... I've, I've heard the name. Basil Bernstein. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, the restricted, restricted code and elaborated code, that distinction of his. Tell me about it. Well, I, I, I go through it again in this recent book, but I have talked about it in my stuff in the past. And uh, he, he pointed out some class relationships uh, he asked, well, there was an experiment where some kids, uh, this was in England, were uh, looking at soccer, and the soccer ball goes through somebody's living room window, and the lady is coming out very irate about this. And uh, some middle-class kids are asked to describe this set of cartoons, and, and lower-class kids are asked to describe the cartoons. And um, the... Disadvantaged children are saying, he kicked the ball, she got really mad. Uh, the middle class kids would say, uh, they were playing soccer, the ball went, accidentally flew through the window, and when it broke a window, the lady came out and she got, you know, about 25 times as many words. Were the responses written or spoken? No, no, these are spoken. Okay, all these right. They're all spoken responses, but the kids have internalized, the middle class kids have internalized how to speak to strangers a little bit more. The disadvantaged kids, and, and so uh, Bernstein had invented this distinction between restricted code and elaborated code. Okay. And uh, he was then challenged by William LeBov, who is a sociolinguistic li linguist at uh, Penn, a distinguished one. And, and uh, LeBov pointed out that well, <laughs> the restricted speech was getting as much information across as the elaborated speech was, which was absolutely true. But what Bernstein's distinction helped clarify was a, a difference between intimate speech and speech to an unseen audience or, or speech to strangers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, what school has to teach kids is how you communicate with strangers. This is a, and this is the only way communication tends to occur in writing, of course, because right. the audience is unseen. Well, there's another modulator here. I don't know to what extent that uh, you've explored this, this, I would imagine you have, which has to do with the affect dimension. Right. I right. mean, to the extent that um, yes. the, the children are less comfortable, then um, <clears throat> that's going to uh, punctuate, regulate, restrict the degree of elaboration as a uh, an aversion yeah. to exposure that's right. that's all emotionally regulated. Oh, yes. That doesn't have anything to do with, it. And, and and that's one of the things that's yeah. really important to us is yeah. understanding that. I mean, most of the people that struggle with learning blame themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and right. and that leads to an automatic 
just as, just like reading is faster than conscious and, and directing all kinds of cognitive activity, um, these emotional aversions are fundamental to regulating uh, attention and uh, uh, and the learning and and explication processes. But surely the affect is going to be changed uh, if there's more confidence and more knowledge. Right. And so the bottom line seems to me to be very similar uh, in either whether you're emphasizing um, the requirements of communicating with strangers or uh, or the affective side which inhibits it. Right. Uh, you are going to change that if you if your school policy is to give kids the knowledge they need. So, so long as the way that your policy gets uh, instrumented and, and implemented um, uh, takes those children through the kind of relevancy stretches that won't cause them to develop uh, you know, an aversion that's working against what you're doing. Right. Well, let me, I, I, it's a curious that when you called, I had, uh, I was uh, going over, <laughs> we're, we may go bankrupt because I haven't got funding for this, but we're doing it anyway. It's a huge project to make a, a reading program that actually includes a great deal of long stretches uh, on a domain, uh -huh. reading, reading aloud to kindergartners and then first graders and second graders. Uh, you stay on a topic for two or three weeks, and uh, you're reading all of this stuff to them. And they are... I mean, I, I think it's very exciting because gradually, if you stay on a topic long enough, I think the familiarity, I think what you've described also has, a, a, you know, blaming yourself and ethic and so on, is, is a, a difference between kids who from advantaged backgrounds are familiar with certain things and kids from disadvantaged backgrounds who are unfamiliar with those things. Right, and if you can devise a plan of schooling that will optimize the possibility of familiarizing kids, making them comfortable, right, with with this knowledge. So I'm very, uh, <laughs> I'm getting pretty antique now. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> oh, good for you! I'd love to. I'd love to find out more about that as that develops. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm also interested in. And, and working to network um, <clears throat> different people in different organizations that are doing things that can really make a difference. So, what is your, let me write down. Yeah, you've got your, this website, but I didn't write down what that is. And, uh, right I, down. I, I, I have uh, two websites that might interest you. Um, one is childrenofthecode.org, and it's all one string, childrenofthecode.org. Uh -huh. And the other one is implicity. Uh -huh. I-M-P-L-I-C-I-T-Y dot uh -huh. org. Uh -huh. What's that? That one's all about learning. Um, and, and it goes into things. And, me, and, and would you mind telling me your name again? David, last name Bolton, B-O-U-L-T-O-N. Okay. Excellent. And where, where, are you, where do you live? I'm in uh, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh -huh. So we're not far apart. Uh, how did you get into all this? Well... Um, gosh, about 25 years ago now, I was uh, the president of a robotics company as a young guy, and uh, I I, uh, I kind of woke up one day and said, I don't want to, I felt like a cannonball at Apogee, not wanting to go down the way I came up, and uh, <laughs> I... I, I, I <laughs> okay. And uh, th that put me on a learning binge. And I went, geez, for a year. I shut down my business. My, I just went on this. I was insatiable. And uh, what I came to realize was that I could learn anything if what I was learning from responded to what it was I actually needed in the flow of my learning. Yeah. Now, you know, Stick, uh, again, uh, I just got an interesting message from him. Uh, he uh, he he found out working for the Navy, he would do uh -huh. learning pro projects for the Navy and reading projects for the Navy. He's a good researcher. And he um, found out that if 
the topic was something that not only did they know, if they knew something about it, but also if they had that particular job uh, performance mo motivation, they could read much better. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, taking that approach made them end up doing better on sort of uh, topic neutral tests uh, of reading. So, so it. it you're, you're really onto something there, clearly. Well, w one of the places where all this kind of intersects for me is I'm trying to get the neuroscientists to um, probe into the um, turbulence on cognitive processes that resulting from affect processes. In other words, that, that attention is power, is a, is a, is got, is, it has emotional power. Yeah, but how do you, how I'm, I can con, I can control the knowledge I'm imparting to kids, but I don't think I can control their affect. You can't, but you can you can by becoming more aware of their affect fluctuations, being able to read them. Oh, really? I a, and being able to help uh, contextualize what you're doing so as to minimize the uh, trajectories that have propensities into shame and negative oh, oh, self emotions oh, right, that, right, that, right. that one of the biggest problems facing uh, a child uh, in the learning to read process is almost universally they blame themselves for the frustration they experience yeah and that um, develop, turns into a an aversion that's that's actually dissipating the cognitive resources so necessary that, to do the work it's too bad when guilt is self-defeating, but of course guilt can be productive. <laughs> sure, sure. It was, it was guilt that has generated all my activity, or at least it was part of it. I, I, in <laughs> affect language, I, I would say sh shame is the most unique human learning prompt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and I was just hearing about Harvey Mansfield's new book, which is, of course, going back to the Greeks and uh, Aristotle and Plato's, the, the Greek notion of thumos. Honor, shame, you know those those motivations, uh, as uh, which they saw as central. Yes. To uh, well, there, there's a. You ever heard the uh, name Sylvan Tompkins? No. He but is he going to be on your? Uh, no, he's deceased. Uh -huh. I, I did interview somebody who was his um, successor, who's named by the name of Donald Nathanson. Wrote a book called Shame and Pride. Ah, really? Which is really a great piece of work. Uh -huh. But I, what I'm interested in is not just the the common lay description of these things, but w uh, affect as the neurobiological precursors of emotion, uh -huh. and how they um, intermix to both power and interrupt cognitive entrainment. That's interesting because uh, you know this fits in. Now, there's a lot of talk about motivation in schools of education. Uh -huh. And I, that's another, let me ask you a practical question about what you're doing. Okay. How do you see, see this as intersecting in how professors of education think and what schools of education do? I'm asking you the questions now. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's a, you know what? I'm all about dialogue first. You know, so I, I really, I'm honored to talk with you, and I appreciate the fact that we're going where we go. Um, well, one of the things that we're doing is providing a, a kind of reference library that's spreading in the universities now for students um, who are interested in learning and in learning to read in particular to access directly all of these different minds that are working in this space so that they're less mediated by the professors. I see. So that's one thing. We also have a number of professors that are, are actually starting to pick up on our work. So some of them are, are, are things that are being used in university courses. But in schools of education? In schools of education. Well, that's good. Yeah. And um, one but of the... Mind you, it, the, one thing, the one thing where one must not tread, I taught in a school of education in my last years uh -huh. here, and it seems to me that this issue, and the reason I'm pressing it so hard in my own work and so on, is the one issue that they resist, and that is specifying content. Specifying content is something that can't, isn't, is a no-no. Yeah, well, they're overgeneralizing, and um, if it's a total failure to understand that uh, attention, you know, the, uh, the engagement of attention, the cycles of attention, and the relationship between uh, relevancy 
and which is the act of relifting of knowledge um, so as to create the reference for stretching into the new. Yeah. And, and without, uh, you know, it seems to me if you really take learning itself on what is learning, you come to the necessity of specifying knowledge whenever you particularize learning. Yeah. yeah well, they don't particularize it. Yeah. That's the problem. I mean, and so I, I, see, I see that particular set of ideas, which I, I need another term for. My colleague, Matt Davis, tells me I should use another word other than formalism to describe this content-free approach. So I need to work on rhetoric. Well, you know, this is another thing. You are getting all of these great thoughts together, but what I have discovered in my couple of decades now in in education reform is that the intellectual principles are, relatively speaking, easy compared to the rhetorical problem, rhetorical political problem. What I, what, what I call the institutional inertia. Intellectual and institutional. Yes. Yeah. Both. Yes. The, the, the combination. Um, and Max Planck made this remark about professors. I mean, he was thinking about quantum theory, but about professors never changing their minds. Yeah, the they, physics uh, only advances because professors die. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking about Einstein and Bohr at two different ends of the room. Yeah. Now he was I don't think I don't think he was referring to them. I think he was referring to all the old guys who didn't accept quantum well, to some extent, I, I don't think he was talking about Einstein. But well, I think it was Bohm. I, had a, uh, I don't know if you ever encountered the name David Bohm. Oh, was, sure. I've read his, uh, I tried to read <laughs> his book. Which one, Wholeness and the Implicate Order? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I tried uh, to read it. I used to have many dialogues with him. And uh, I, was, I was involved in MIT's Organizational Learning Center on the dialogue project that he inspired. Really? Yeah, so. I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm very impressed. He was, he was, anybody he was, who deals with physicists of my admiration, and mathematicians. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future uh, quantum semantics, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, um, okay, well, uh, I didn't, I, I, I dealt with, you know, this what is learning, where should education go, that, that sort of thing. We, we dealt with that a little bit. Yes, we did, we did. So, um, <clears throat> relative to I guess the, the relationship, we, we've covered some nice ground, and I really appreciate the, the, the conversation that we have had. I wanted to go into the um, domains of knowledge, relationship to vocabulary, relationship to comprehension, which I know you've articulated really well in some of your papers, but just for um, our readers here. Okay. And by the way, before I forget about it, because you are in Virginia? Yeah. Okay. Um, if uh, if I can get out there later this year for a video shoot, would you be open to that? Sure. When you say later this year, uh, we leave Virginia on the first of June. Okay. And you can uh, and go up to Maine. Okay. And uh, how long do you stay in Maine? Four months. Okay. So I don't know that I get there before the first of June, but I might get to Maine or catch you when you get back. Okay. But I'd love to uh, meet you in the person, right. and I'd love to continue our conversation with the camera running. Well, of course, at my age, I've now forgotten what the initial topic was that you introduced before we had this little digression. Uh, oh, yeah, you wanted to, uh, the, the decision about what domains of knowledge, is that the question? The relationship between domain of knowledge, vocabulary, uh, and uh, comprehension. Well, I think the I, I I don't think I would answer it in those uh, uh, separated analytical okay uh, components anyway. because people the people who have uh, studied comprehension have made the real breakthrough. You know, and there used to be a lot of talk about schema and schema theory right in in discussions of comprehension, but the operative term ever since uh, Kinch and Van Dyke wrote their book in about 1983, uh, <coughs> has been situation model. Mm -hmm. That this is what we construct when we comprehend speech, whether it's written or heard. And that's very good, because it has elements that 
the speech is providing and elements that come from your own so-called background knowledge, but they're all coming together to produce some kind of, well, modeling of, of reality, whether it's a, you know, imaginary reality. It doesn't have to be physical. It could be some sort of mental space. But some, there's, there's, there's some situation that, that is being modeled. And, and so I think it's a very important to fix the learning in that referential idea, language of being referential. Mm -hmm. and not just a matter of abstract conceptual domains and uh, vocabulary. And one of the reasons I mentioned George Miller to you in, in relation to vocabulary is that he uh, believes that we have gained vocabulary knowledge by remembering little bits of context along with our mm -hmm. memories of words. And there's a lot of evidence. He has a, a piece in annual review of psychology that summarizes a lot of this stuff. And I think it's the best work on vocabulary acquisition. What does it mean to know a word or learn a word is, I think, the title. And I'm very taken with the notion that we learn words and learn comprehension by learning things, by learning what things refer to, by taking that as our point. Of, of reference. So the multi-ordinal uh, nature of words is an emergent property of e experiencing words in specific contexts. Yes, it's emergent, and it also uh, uh, comes about and is optimized when we are learning about something or understanding something. I guess I'm, I'm stressing what I call the referential aspect here. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that is or what the you know, philosophers used to call the intentional, the special meaning of the word intention. The, the, the idea that you, there's some sort of projective uh, reality that you're engaged in. It's not just the internal processes. Uh, now, of course, it, it, what's happening is a lot of internal processes. But what brings them together and what makes the processes work efficiently, it seems to me, is learning about stuff. Yeah. That's, that's all. Again, I mean, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in a generalized uh, vacuum. It happens in specific contexts where we're engaging. That's right. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Where we're engaging, or I mean, I, when when you called, I was just doing a, a what is a 21-day a, a unit on Christopher Columbus for kindergartners. <laughs> <laughs> 21 days. And boy, they're going to learn. I mean, they're going to learn all kinds of stuff because it's all about Christopher Columbus and all this stuff he did. And they're going to learn what the word seafaring means, uh -huh. not because uh, they've got some abstract definition of seafaring, but because we're talking about Columbus and he saw this activity going on when he was a boy in Genoa and so on. Right. And so that's how they learn what the word seafaring means. Right. A absolutely. When, when I said the word vocabulary, I did not mean to, to refer to in any way, shape, or form uh, lists of memorative uh, you know, associations, right. but rather the immersive process of, of actually owning the word. Yeah, but, but we do that. We do that uh, at best when we're understanding more and more of the situation model. Now, you can call it context. Context is an odd word. I mean, I, that's obviously a, a, the critical word. But context means little bits and pieces of a, of a situation. I mean, it's a situation that we're actually dealing with mentally. I think of context as the, uh, the parabolic umbrella <laughs> to the um, specific stream happening at the point of the parabola, you know, that it's the field that's informing yeah. it, rather that's than right. it's then it's a then it's a then it's a bunch of bits. That's a wonderful way of saying it, calling it a field. Yeah, yeah. so I, I actually yeah. I think of yeah. learning itself as like inverting the parabola yeah. between yeah. foreground and background, yeah. context and right. meaning. Well I love your, your math and geometrical analysis, your cannonball attitude. <laughs> 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 oh, great. Well I, I hope I, we do meet. Uh, look forward to If you come to Maine, we'll sit by the side of the water and discuss it. Yes, it would be great. I, I, yeah, I would. Uh,
I'd be interested in meeting you. Yeah, I'd be interested in meeting you too. I'm really honored to talk with you. I, I would, um, as you progress with this reading project, yeah. Um, you know, if you don't mind, uh, put have your office put my name on the you know list of circulation about that because I'd love to stay in co connection with that. Right. And uh, I'll uh, have read uh, your new book before we next talk. Okay. Very good. Well, I much enjoyed the conversation, and I don't know uh, how much coherent and useful. I, I think it's good for people to take the kind of journey that we just did. Oh, okay. I think it's good for them to be able to enter into a, a stream of dialogue rather than a polished mechanical, uh, you know, unfolding that's that's um, just nowhere near as engaging or rich. Inter interesting. Well, I'm going to go to your website, and I, as I say, I, I much enjoyed it, and uh, wish you luck with it. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Have a great one.